during our one of our task force meetings recently, I we interviewed a person from Martin Marietta, which is sort of like construction. And so they have projects all over the nation. And so that one of their people who is dedicated solely to the use tax that they have to calculate it, all the jurisdictional issues, it was fantastic to get her testimony, right? And have these legislators hear like how nuanced it is, how specific she's created a matrix to manage her compliance mm -hmm. as a business that is not out in the universe for other people to borrow. They got to create it themselves. So it's very costly to figure that out. Where mm -hmm. am I? Who am I? What do I need to do? They had to do it. They're a multi, you know, large, very, very big company. You don't have that from the small mama pops. And I thought America, the bulk of our businesses are small business, not big. Yeah. So are we yeah, and it's, create that culture or not? You know? Well, and it's, we talk about American small businesses as being the backbone, backbone right. of the backbone American economy. Of America. Yeah. And, you know, we're all familiar with death by a thousand cuts. <laughs> This is death by 12,000 cuts. And that's only if you're talking about one item. Uh -huh. If you start talking about multiple TICs, now you've got a multiplier factor in there. Yeah. And if you start talking about the fact that it's implement, or impacting not just sales tax, but income tax and gross receipts tax and customer privacy and consumer protection and all of these things, they're all different. I mean, now you've got death by some exponentially huge number of cuts oh, it is. It is. and it bleeds us out. Well, and, and kind of circling back on something you just touched at on the small businesses that aren't necessarily compliant, one of your suggestions has to do with those companies that are not in compliance. And, you know, do you want to talk through maybe what what that strategy is or what that recommendation is for those non-compliant taxpayers, right? Judy and I make a living doing voluntary disclosure agreements. But those, you know, cost a lot of businesses money. So there is some remediation out there, but it sounds like you may have a more simplified or streamlined or, you know, maybe something that that's easier for those companies that can't afford to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars getting into compliance. Well, I don't actually have a very good answer for this. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. So the the national director of the streamlined sales tax governing board mm -hmm. craig johnson wrote an article a year or two ago basically stating that there needs to be a degree of amnesty provided to those businesses that are still not compliant um he was completely rebuffed by the states uh whenever you try to talk about amnesty it it blows a conversation up so there is no there's no good answer there but what i think really has to be part of that conversation and this is i'm going to pivot a little bit here going back to the constituent small businesses and recognizing what the potential cost of not offering some form of amnesty are i'll use halstead bead numbers because i know them um, if i go back to the supreme court's decision in 2018 and i don't comply at all whether it's out of ignorance or just out of a refusal it doesn't really matter they're both equivalent um, I've done about $32 million worth of sales since that decision. And if I am audited by all of the states where we have a compliance obligation, it numbers about 20, then I'm looking at about $20 million worth of uh, transactions where I have not collected sales tax. Using 8% for argument's sake as a, as a sales tax rate, now I'm looking at $1.6 million worth of sales uncollected sales tax. And the penalties and interest, they're punitive. So let's just say $2 million is what I owe. Um, I think that's low. <laughs> well, <laughs> what adds up each year? I always feel like it's almost double the tax because the interest adds up right each month. It's due, and then you compound that. It's not compounded, but you know what I mean. It just adds up at all the filings, and then next thing you know, your interest calc is insane, and the penalty mm -hmm. is like fifty G's or more. Yeah, craziness. So, well, okay. So let's let's work with three million dollars because that's a more fun okay, I number. like that. Or two million more terrifying. Ridiculous. Okay, just gonna right. two million is crazy. Okay. <laughs> so we'll we'll work with three million because that's that's <laughs> even more fun. Um, Halstead Bead's assets in total are worth about a million five. <laughs> so we have to liquidate the company, terminate twenty two employees. My wife and I are now uh, you know out of unemployed as well. So there's twenty four jobs that are gone. Um, We've lost our business. That's a million five that are gone, but there's still another million five we got to come up with. Right. So because sales tax failures to collect and remit and report sales tax viol or breach 
the um, the protective shield between a corporation's misdeeds and the owner's personal finances. Now, those uh, different departments of revenue can take my home. Right. They can take my retirement account. They can take my kid's college fund. All of this adds up. So basically, you're talking about a complete the complete annihilation of my economic past, present, and potentially future as well. Now, going back to the constituents, these are people you're talking about. We talk about businesses as if there's some abstract. There are people right. behind every business. Uh -huh. So what you're doing as, let's say it's my lawmakers here in the state of Arizona, and they're doing this to a business in Iowa. Mm -hmm. They're not going to feel the consequences, but they are certainly going to feel the consequences of it when California does it to me yep, or to my neighbor or to one of the, you know, 40 or hundreds of thousands of small businesses across the country. I think there's what, 31 million small businesses across the country, according to yeah, the I SBA. Yeah, Let's okay. say 10% of them should be doing this. So that's still over 3 million businesses. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact, uh, two years ago, there was only 8,000 or so businesses that were registered with Arizona as remote sellers. Right. Where are the rest? I know. Where are they? So when you get into this, I think the solution is going to be unpalatable from a policy position, but from a humane position, amnesty is something that really has to be considered. And it, it's going to have to come out of the state houses of, of, uh, of regulation and, and, and legislation because coming from Washington, it's going to be seen as a preemptive attempt. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to be come from the, the, the ground. It's going to have to be grassroots effort basically at the local level. And it's going to have to be a recognition by city managers, town managers, county managers, state managers, you name it. Every single jurisdictional manager is going to have to look at this and say, wow, we have a real financial calamity on our hands if we don't address this properly. Um, now, what we recommend in the bill is a little less draconian than what I was just talking about. It's, uh, it's really just saying that there is nothing, the states cannot go back beyond uh, June 21st of 2018 and apply Wayfair retroactively. And it's the expectation that perhaps they'll allow for voluntary disclosure agreement so that that one and a half million dollars in, in penalties and interest that we were discussing a few minutes ago isn't part of that calculation. So it's still a million five for us or a million six, which still wipes out our business, but maybe we can take out a loan. I don't know. <laughs> um, and then also recognizing the fact that a lot of businesses just are not compliant because they don't even know. And how right. do you address for that? Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest loose ends that has to be has to be addressed. And I don't know that I'm the most appropriate person to dis discuss it, primarily because we have been compliant and I'm just spitballing. Um, I think the real world ramifications and implications of not doing it are going to be felt um, quietly at first uh, because small businesses die quietly. Mm -hmm. um, but as jobs start disappearing and state legislators start wondering what's happening to their revenue, uh, maybe they're going to recognize the correlation. I don't know. Well, I uh, a few years ago, I think it was the Multi-State Tax Commission offered up an amnesty. I don't know if you recall, that was like, I don't know, 20-something states participated. Um, and they advertised it. And I remember being on a feedback uh, to say, you should push this to January 1 and not have it be November, which is the middle of a tax year. So now you're going to get them sales tax compliant, but not income tax compliant. So it's just such silly i thought so in the end they put this out it's out in the media people are talking about it 900 companies 900 and they were excited that was a good amount i'm like that's nothing that's nothing mm -hmm. that obviously you didn't get in front of the millions of taxpayers that are just playing the game of the lottery you know because the truth is that three million that you owe you don't know what from every state, right? So it's a matter of who's going to pick you off first. So right, right. they're not all going to audit you. Like you said, at the same time, they don't do it that way. So you really, your chances of like having to owe that true 3 million is are slim to none, which is another reason why people don't comply. Because they're like, let them catch me. That is not the way to deal with voluntary compliance. Catch me if you can. That's not best way to be a business owner. I mean, I appreciate we're entrepreneurial, but why would we want to do that? We would want to comply, right? So it's like- let the train leave the station. Here you go. You're protecting yourself as a business owner, but the cost. So, yeah. Well, and I've never, I've never talked to a business owner that says, forget them. Right. Screw them. I don't want to do this. Yep. Um, you know, basically every business owner that I've talked to says, I do want to comply. Yep. I just don't know how. 
or it's yep. too expensive or I don't have the tools. I don't have the resources. And for small businesses like ours, I mean, we cannot afford one of the big four. They're not going to talk to us. Our local, our local um, professionals don't understand it. So we're left with a really big um, gap in, in providers that can assist us. And so it does become an internal thing. No, um, right. And software is trying to solve that problem, but they're software companies. They're not tax advisors. And so there's a disparity there. A lot of people have avoided sales tax, even in my career. Like I remember thinking after I did a couple of busy seasons, like I kind of like the sales tax thing. There's it, you're kind of on the curve, lots of different states, kind of get to travel remotely. I don't know. I just found it really fascinating in a way to be an advocate, but not a lot of people like it because it is very complicated. And there's a lot to think about state by state that is not black and white. You can't take a one size fits all approach. You've really got to understand those nuances. Yeah. And, and well, you know, I understand the nuances of my customers. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I was going to say, you know, kind of on that, one of your suggestions was to kind of have like a centralized database where kind of all of these rules live, right? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And so that would be great, right? Because we even have had that discussion with some of, you know, our, we participate in the Colorado Tax Auditors Coalition. So it's, you know, a group of the 70 home rule cities, their auditors, they get together once a quarter, they collaborate. You know, we are members of this, you know, we've become friendly with them. We speak at these kind of conferences and whatnot. And even we were saying like, hey, Denver, Boulder, Golden, if you all kind of came together and like, maintained a list of like, hey, well, what is your exemption certificate? What is this? That would be incredibly helpful to your potential taxpayers. So we knew it's, again, kind of the central theme. It's we're not against giving you money. We just don't know how. And so it sounds like, you know, mm -hmm. if we can't even get, you know, 70 Coloradans together, right? Do we like how much or how, you know, how willing do you think it the states would be to kind of create the centralized repository, and you know it's 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 a wonderful suggestion yeah because information data information gathering is difficult right um but yeah how you know the best way to maintain it or who's responsible for it or yeah streamline was a start but not everybody yeah. participated it, that was at least like we've got a common set of definitions. You could opt in or out. And then if they adopt it, then they kind of have that, which I think is phenomenal. And if we could have just get the other 20 something states to participate, right? I mean, and some of them are not even that far off, but they're enough off that you can't just check the same box, right? So, I mean, I thought that was a phenomenal start. And if we could marry off that, why not? Yeah, I, I don't, I really wish people had looked at the three million dollars they're missing out on. If you think about you compared to anybody else, and really we're talking one point five, right? Because it's just tax collected. One point five, your company. Okay, let's multiply that by a million. Can you imagine the money our governments would have? We could get so many wonderful things done. We have to make it simpler, but we just piecemeal it, and then we kick off the one or two companies. And like you said, you nobody cares if you've gone out of business except the people in your immediate circle. Nobody really recognizes how many businesses fail for these reasons. Is that how we want our society to run? Well, and I, <laughs> Meredith, you said something earlier that kind of made me think of Lethal Weapon, ah! you know, the, the 1980s movie where, ah. where the different departments are fighting with each other ah! over jurisdictional control of an investigation. Right! Oh my gosh, and, that's right. You know, that's a big theme and a lot of the, I don't think it's as big a theme today as it used to be back in the 80s and 90s, but there were all of these different jurisdictions that were basically fighting with each other to accomplish the same thing. Uh -huh. And, you know, there's nothing I can do as a small business to get Golden to cooperate with Boulder. Yeah. Um, I just can't. And I, I, I think I think the part that I'm, I am always missing out on, and I don't know how to address this, is is how to help them to see that by cooperating, they're actually going to be better off for it. Yes. Well, I, I gave some statistics on the task force of the money that's gone to all your locals in Arizona. Oh, yeah? You have a common point of collection or remittance, and it meant real money to the locals. So I don't know what kind of squawking you're hearing now from your locals, but my perception has been wildly successful. And I can't imagine that it hasn't been incredibly helpful for the locals. 
but I don't know that directly. I know a little bit. I've done some diligence with some people I know in Arizona, but as an Arizonan, do you have any feedback on that? Well, so Arizona, I was, I've, I've worked on legislation at the state level as well as at the federal level. Um, and the state level legislation has been, you know, a couple key components. And the big one is the single rate per state mm -hmm. for remote sellers. And the local jurisdictions do not like that. Uh -huh. They all give up their that, rate. That is what tanks it every single year. Um, and I understand where they're coming from, but um, I don't necessarily agree with it. Yep. And, you know, I understand that they want their jurisdictional autonomy, but the fact of the matter is that jurisdictional autonomy has a diminishing return on it that is actually costing them revenue as opposed to um, benefiting the businesses that are trying to deal with Arizona. And it hurts the consumer too. Uh -huh. um, you know, the cost of compliance for us, I've mentioned it, it's $428,000, $29,000. Um, that, those costs do get passed on. We do not absorb those costs. We can't. That's not the nature of business. Uh, so what does that mean for the end consumer? It actually means that they're paying substantially greater prices before you even get to the taxing point. Uh, because we have, to, we have to cover the cost of that compliance within our wholesale pricing. Um, and it's... You know, this is we've had a lot of inflation in the last couple of years, largely driven by a lot of money printing. But I think there's some administrative inflation that's already baked into those numbers that nobody fully understands, because how could you? There's so many different variables do you have to consider. And um, the states, the local jurisdictions, the cost to them for us, you know, Arizona might see an increase in sales tax collection from us, but they're going to see a greater offset in losses in income tax from us because we're spending more money trying to comply. <laughs> That's funny. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. And what I'll tell you in Colorado, I don't know this specifically to Arizona or not, but we have uh, tax incremental financing for uh, projects that are kind of supported by the cities. So they have bonds that the cities in Colorado specifically might be guaranteed by tax income. So if they change their rate or they change something, then they could be at jeopardy for losing that financing. And so we've got a lot of things created on top of set ideas, which is you have the autonomy to set your rate. You're going to get the certain amount without really thinking, well, it may not materially affect a change because you'd have more taxpayers filing your jurisdiction if you lowered the rate and went with the fixed rate and conform with everybody else. But there's this feeling like we don't know. So they don't run the numbers. They don't really know what it would, how many more taxpayers would we have to get to make up that differential? If we knew that we might get more compliance. So mm -hmm. there is real money happening in Arizona with a one point of remittance. I appreciate the rate is a mess, but at least you have one place to remit. We still don't. I mean, we have our set system in Colorado, but it's not a, at, you know, it's not at full compliance yet. And then you've got, you know, what I always argue with our Coloradans is, you know, Texas can handle 1,714 jurisdiction. I believe it's 256 for California, not even as many as us. We're like 700 from a <laughs> county city home rule, right? I mean, it's a lot for our opponent. I mean, our state is small. We have like five, six million humans living here. Yes, we're a little spread out, but mm -hmm. we are not a giant metropolitan state. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a lot of extra compliance that is driven by the local in city. You know, I live here. I have a, I have a place here, but not the front door delivery. And that's a, mm -hmm. that's, that's not helpful to a tax. And the, and the other thing I would just say to you is you are basically you're being billed by the government, right? They don't exist but for tax. So if you weren't giving it to them, they don't have money. So mm -hmm. be thanking you for doing that for them, being their billing engine. We are conscripted tax administrators is what we really are. Um, but going to the local thing, you know, we bump into issues with them and they, uh, they have a force shield. You know, if you think about Star Wars, you got a force shield, nothing can get through it, right? The cities and local communities and, and the states have a force field and it's called the Tax Injunction Act. And it makes it makes solutions for this problem have to be driven by legislation only because there is no legal recourse for a company like ours against anything that's going on. We tried. We tried to sue the state of Louisiana. Um, we have a very good case there, but we were we were um, we basically lost out because we were said that we don't have standing. Um, and it's because of the Tax Injunction Act. And the Tax Injunction Act initially was set up to prevent local governments from abuse by major multi-state corporations. Uh, but because 
to our local tax jurisdictions and the state departments of revenue have gained so much power and, and strength within the economy in the last 100 years. Um, that's kind of flipped and major companies can still fight them. They do. I don't know what their success rate is, but for a company like Halstead, we effectively have no access to the legal system in any kind of jurisdiction where we have meaningful, a meaningfully fair uh, playing field to be on. And you're, and you're forced to comply. Hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. That, so that, it, that's it, an inconsistent legal standing in my humble opinion. If you're going to have to be registered to give them money and you have no standing to sue them, that's craziness. Well, let's talk about Public Law 86272 for a moment. <laughs> okay. So that's the 1959 law that effectively limits states' ability to tax a company if they don't have a physical presence in a state. That physical okay. presence is established through inventory, property, or employees. We have no physical presence in any state but Arizona. Yet for the last five years, we've been paying income tax to California, to Hawaii, and to Washington. Now I'm going to pick on Hawaii because it's just an, it's the easiest, most straightforward thing to discuss. <laughs> There's a purely an income tax, which is why they're the easiest one to discuss. Um, they are in violation of public law 86272. Now I send them a few hundred dollars a year in income taxes. The only way that I get legal recourse for that is to demand a refund from the state for income taxes I shouldn't have had to file. And then when they refuse to pay me, and they will, then I have to sue the State Department of Revenue in Hawaiian courts. Now, if I go to Hawaii, I've established physical presence, which vi or voids my argument in the first place. And if I try to take it into a federal court system, I lose out on tax injunction acts, which means I don't have standing. So what is my solution? At this point in time, my solution is pay the bill and be quiet. 500 bucks. It's just not worth it. You can't, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I also tell my clients, like they get upset about a 20, 40, $50,000 assessment. I'm like, you can't sue for that small amount of tax. And I know it's a lot. Right. To it's not mm -hmm. enough. And so we have seen a lot of taxes being capitulate. I mean, you have to capitulate basically because there's just too expensive to, to fight it. You just got to do it. It's not worth it. It becomes a path of least resistance to not raise it up. If we could get a class action, maybe that would be, you know, the way to do it. But there, I mean, I'm sure there's knowledge of it. Once again, there's some apathy to um, deal with it because it's so little here and there, but it is a burden on you. Well, and I, I think, I think, to your listening audience on this, you've got practitioners, you've got businesses, you've got policymakers, all of them need to recognize the role they play in this. And if they think it's okay, if the status quo is acceptable to them, then, then remain quiet. But if it's not, one of the chief complaints I hear whenever I go to Washington, D.C. to advocate on this is that they're just not hearing about it. Now, I know they're not hearing about it because a lot of business owners are afraid of putting their hand up for fear of being audited. But the reality is, until the people that actually make the decisions understand the vastness of this problem, they're not going to address it. And I, you know, this is the me being the, the pessimist in the moment, which I don't like to be. I see this as a ticking time bomb and it's going to be huge. It's only a matter of time before the states become desperate for revenue. The last several years have been very good to their coffers, but that's not always going to be the case. And when they actually do start going after businesses, the further out from that decision date that we are, the longer businesses have been out of compliance, the greater the assessments they're going to be handed, right. the greater the penalties and interest are. And so to your listening audience, um, you know, I appreciate that this is your business and this is what you do, helping businesses like ours comply. But your businesses, your clients aren't going to exist in 20 years or 10 years if they're audited out of existence. And, you know, what's the objective? Is the objective to help this run a efficiently and smoothly, or is the objective to maximize as much gain and revenue as we can in the short term while forgetting the 10 year plan. And Correct. if we forget the 10 year plan, we're sunk. That's because they're not constituents. And I'll be honest, I would rather have my business be getting everybody set up and compliant and help it, you know, done and help 3 million taxpayers than having to say, mm -hmm. I can't help 3 million because we have all this mitigation to do for the next year because you were not compliant. I don't, mm -hmm. I, it's fine with what we do, but it's, I don't think it's the best and highest use of our skills. The best thing is to say, let's get you fixed and let's go. Right. And then you can sleep at night. So um, I couldn't agree more. I would love to just do Nexus studies, exposure, and like get a license <laughs> and set up sales tech software if needed. Um, mm -hmm. Just get them going and they'd be so happy and compliant. And then, you know, it's also for you, I'm sure you're like, I'm not going to just do two. I'm going to do three. Okay, I'm just going to do 50, right? I mean, you at some point you're like, 
I already got the engine in place. I'll go ahead and do them all. I'm just not going to turn it off. Once again, wildly compliant. Good fact for government if we can make that streamlined. And if you took like a Massachusetts or uh, a Maryland. Yes, one yeah, I love that. One I know. And the submission form is dead simple. I know. Yeah. It really is. I mean, yeah. You take take Massachusetts and you compare them to Hawaii. Hawaii is fairly straightforward. Not exactly, but it's fairly straightforward. Massachusetts is dead simple. My, you know, my kid could have done it when he was in first grade. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, because I did all those forms by hand in 1996. I mean, I'm like, oh my gosh, first of all, Arizona. Like uh, this is when I first did it. I um, didn't take the vendor fee because I followed the prior practitioner. They didn't know there was a vendor fee. I was filling out so many forms by hand. I didn't even see it. And then mm -hmm. I missed it. So my, because I didn't assert it on the filing, my client didn't get it. And the, and the, their person who internally prepared it didn't give it to them either. So, I mean, we missed that because you can't read every line on each form because they're wildly different. So mm -hmm. it was insanely stressful to do the Arizona return and then recognize I wasn't even getting the love back to my poor client for not doing that, you know, because their prior prepared it and I followed what they did and realized later after that time, like, Oh my gosh, I could be getting this money back and just putting it on the form and taking it, right? Yeah. Oh, I can't even tell you. People don't understand how to fill out the forms. Yeah. Well, the the vendor fee. So we're wholesale. Uh, we have a little bit of retail, which is why we have some collected sales tax. But we we spend a huge amount of time managing exemption certificates, which is one of our solutions. Is a a, a single uniform exemption certificate that's a you know usable across the entire country that puts the onus of responsibility on the shoulders of the provider, not the recipient. Because right now, if I have one. If I fail, I mean, if I have an exemption certificate that's not valid and I'm not collecting sales tax, they're still going to expect me to pay it. Um, that should be on the provider's shoulders, not mine. But um, going even further into what you were just discussing, that that vendor fee, my vendor fee in Maryland is typically 12 or 13 cents. Because we don't collect sales tax. Right. I spend a lot of time to huh? collect very little. Uh, and and. You know, the Wayfair decision was about retail sales. Wayfair at the time of the decision, I think they were $6.3 billion. We were 6.1 million. So they were 1,100 times larger than us. Right. And I don't know, I don't know how much wholesale or, you know, B2B business they have. Mm -hmm. I know they have a lot more uh, B2C business than we have. We're not a B2C operation. Um, there's a little bit that slips through and that's because of the structure of our customers as opposed to our end users. Because when I sell you 10 beads or a hundred feet of chain. It's not like you're going to wear those. You're <laughs> actually going to make something else and then sell it on. Right. They just may not have registered with their home state. Right. But the Wayfair decision was about retail sales and the states, some have made their thresholds based on retail sales. Others have not. Yeah. Well, it's and inconsistent. It's you have to look at every single one, every single measurement. When does it matter? I mean, we unravel that whole thing to tell taxpayers because it matters. Like you don't just say, I have to register in July 1, 2020, 2018. No, no, no. If we can get it to 2021, way mm -hmm. better answer for the customer in terms of remediation or filing. Mm -hmm. And then you can take the liability from there. You don't just get unlimited look back. Yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. That is kind of an infuriating lack of conformity amongst our states and their adoption process. Yeah. Well, and, and it makes you, it begs the question, especially from my vantage point, why are they using gross receipts as the <laughs> threshold? for sales tax economic nexus policies. And it's because as I've seen over and over and over again, the states are using it to um, pry open Pandora's box into other regulatory exportation models. So income tax, gross receipts tax, right. you know, the things I've already talked about. Yep. Um, I don't think that was the point of the, the, leg or the decision. In fact, at first I hated the decision um, I've studied it. I understand it now. And I, I happen to agree with it. Um, okay. And I, I don't, I don't buy the, the dormant clause as strongly as I once did. I think Justice oh, I Clarence think Thomas right. was exactly. The Commerce clause that matters now. Yeah. yeah I think, Dor I think Clarence Thomas was correct in that regard. The dormant clause was not a get out of jail free card for online sellers. Yep. Um, back in 1992 at the Quill decision, Congress was invited to weigh in they demurred for 26 years. Well, then <laughs> Justice Kennedy said, well, I think we should hear this again. Uh -huh. And this decision five, or five and a half years ago was Congress needs to weigh in on this. They have jurisdiction over the regulation of interstate commerce. Uh -huh. They still have demurred. Yeah. Um, 
but I do see promise there. I do see, I do see a solution coming out. What um, has to circle up? Like for people like you speaking and, you know, I mean, tax foundation is speaking to, I mean, they, you know, they were more uh, for federal and they've really gotten multi-state in the last 15 or so years. So mm -hmm. they're really focusing on that because it's driving a lot of money for the economy. And it's also driving a lot of compliance for taxpayers. And they're bringing that up. It's percolating up. I mean, they've spoken to our coalition. They speak wherever. They are there to advocate for that information. Obviously, they brought you on their show. I mean, I feel like mm -hmm. they're really giving a voice for sanity in some of this. And so the more we keep putting that out there, I think the more there's opportunity to see change. I mean, with technology and data, they've got to know What's really at stake here? If someone just looked at it. <laughs> I get asked that question. There was a GAO report last year um, that that kind of dove into a lot of these issues and recommended a lot of the solutions that we're frankly recommending. Um, but there is a dearth of real data and information out there for government resources. And they'll ask me for it. And, you know, I would love to provide it for them, but I'm a small business selling to my clients. I'm not the research organization right. that, that they want and yeah. nor should I be. That's not right. our job. Why is that um, yeah, put on your shoulders? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, and, and it's a very difficult response to give. I don't know. I don't know what the data is going to say, but I think you're going to like it. They don't want to hear that. They want real tangible numbers. Oh, I tell provide. these, I tell these local uh, finance directors and mayors of cities, you have no idea how much money you're giving away by not making this easy because everyone's mm -hmm. not going to register a Mount Crest debut to give them 40 bucks a year. Sorry, mm -hmm. it ain't going to mm -hmm. happen. So we have just planned. As we we're wrap have to have up. another conversation. <laughs> we're already exceeding our time. This is, we have a lot to, Brad, if you would be willing, we would love to continue this conversation because this is you. Yeah. We're hitting on all the things I have been trying to promote for the last, I can't tell you how many years. So Super grateful for you, just so you know. Um, this is good for the world, I think. <laughs> yeah, I warned Meredith that I'm not known for being brief. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> so what, Brad, as we wrap up, what is your ask for our listening audience? What what could be made better? Or what could we do to make things better? How can we advocate for kind of your your list of suggestions? So the first thing that they could do is they could reach out to U.S. congressional offices, specifically in Senate Finance Committee and House Judiciary Committee, because they are the two committees that have jurisdiction over this particular subject matter, and let them know that this is a burden that is beyond acceptable for small businesses. The cost of compliance are too great. The cost of failure are incredibly high. The liability for failure to comply is terribly high. Um, so that's that's my number one thing. Reach out to specific committees in Congress, Senate Finance and House Judiciary. Beyond that, reach out to your own state legislators. Reach out to your own city officials. I talked to my mayor two years ago about this. He came up to me. I was, I was going to give a presentation on this. And um, he said, this has been a great boon for the city of Prescott. We've gotten, I think he said, $23 million because of, of Wayfair taxes. And I said, listen, Mayor, you don't understand the costs associated with this. And we went through basically the conversation that we're having right now. And he said, oh, my gosh, Brad, I had no idea. I'm going to go talk to the League of Cities and Towns. And he started helping us behind the scenes. But I need that conversation coming from 51% of jurisdictions, not five. It has to come from everywhere because until they start hearing en masse, that this is a challenge for their local constituent small businesses, yes. constituents. It goes both ways. Even though you're saying, I don't care about Iowans, that's still affecting Arizonans. This law is affecting mm -hmm. all states' constituents. Mm -hmm. It's just ins and outs of it all, really. Yep. So, so that's the number one ask. The number two ask is not everybody is capable of coming forward. Um, it's just, it's just reality. Either they're time constrained, or they're not a compliant. Or, um, or they just, they're afraid of putting a bullseye on their back to be audited. <laughs> and there are groups out there that are working towards this. And if you can find it in your heart to reach out to them and say, thank you, I'll give you some, some case information if you can keep it anonymous or perhaps offer a small donation. So you mentioned the tax foundation. There's also the national taxpayer union. 
the Goldwater Institute helped us in Arizona. The Pelican Institute helped us in Louisiana. There are organizations. The Manhattan Institute issued a, um, a supportive uh, amicus brief in our lawsuit in Louisiana. The National Federation of Independent Businesses needs to hear more about this. There are a lot of small businesses that could reach out to them and get this made to be a bigger issue. The American Catalog Mailers Association has been a huge driver in this, but they're a relatively small group. So reach out to these groups and find out if there is something that you can do to help them with their efforts moving forward. Um, I didn't know anything about this uh, four or five years ago. And because I started getting vocal, I started having people who are actually working towards solutions like yourselves reach out to me and say, how can we work with you? Well, right. I don't get paid for this. I do this on my own time. That's no, true. I don't get paid a penny. Mm -hmm. but, but the reality is there are a lot of people who are working on this and not everybody can do it out of the goodness of their heart because for them it is a profession. And helping them out either with your own testimony uh, with your letters to your congressional members uh, or, you know, something along those lines or, or really the most crass of ways economically, those are things that I think would be, would be helpful. Yep. Um, unfortunately, I think this is going to be a 20 year solution. It took almost 20 years for the streamlined sales tax governing board to be successful with their efforts. And I think we're probably facing a similar timeline for our, our efforts. I have, gradually come to the realization that I might do this until I retire, but it's something I'm passionate about. And so that's Ew. okay. Me but too. not everybody has that flexibility or that, that time frame available to them. And there or are things that you can do immediately. That kind of that yeah. fight to keep you going because you think it's the right thing to do. I mean, that's why I've been on this task force because I've helped like three to 4,000 taxpayers and it is a difficult conversation when they owe a lot of money. It's mm -hmm. hard. And I it's, it. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I mean, People thank me for bringing them the potatoes. Uh, you know, if I'm at Thanksgiving dinner, pass me the potatoes. Thank you. Pass me the, the turkey. Thank you. When all of a sudden strangers start reaching out, thanking you for suing their home state. <laughs> or, you know, I had a call a couple of weeks ago from a company that is just now coming to terms with what compliance means. And they thanked me for the years of advocacy I put on on this. That's really all I need for motivation is yeah. that knowing that I'm, I'm helping somebody else. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, I, I would so like to think that we're going to have this up no, we're being somewhere. Seen, and we really appreciate you for that because, I mean, I think you may, I've been watching what's been going on with you guys. Um, and so to have an conversation with you in person, you know, this is kind of our passion project, educating mm -hmm. people about the state and local area. We are spreading the gospel of state and local tax, and this is part of it. And so well, if and you make meaningful change, then we have met our calling. And if you're like the 99.99% of the American public that gets bored or frustrated with tax policy conversations, then support those lunatics like ourselves that are. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> They're not lunatics. That's true. I think people just, it's a lot of data points. And I think what people just, and we all got to have things that matter, right? Life has to have meaning aside from our business. And if we can make the world a little bit better place before we leave it, I think that's really important. So I think you're doing yeah. that for the world. So thank you so much, Brad. Yes. Well, thank, thank you, Brad, you. so much for being it. here. It was great conversation. And, you know, like Judy had alluded, we would love I to continue the conversation the both on and off air. So thank you again. And this is another episode of Saltivation. Till next time.